Good evening from the woods of Maine, where it is currently 33 degrees and uh, feels like it's 23. It's very cold. Um, been that way for a while now. In any case, uh, I believe we left off right here where uh, I didn't need to explain anything. Um, this is uh, Don Davis's uh, interpretation of what um, the meteorite that, or asteroid or comet or whatever you want to call it um, hit the Earth about 65 million years ago and caused a uh, massive extinction event that essentially wiped the dinosaurs and ended their, uh, their reign as the most successful species on the planet for about 200 million years. <clears throat> so, um, it, uh, it was, uh, a, you know, cataclysmic event, you know, the estimate is at least six miles, maybe up to nine, uh, miles, you know, size of Manhattan rock just slamming into the, um, Earth's crust with little to no resistance from the atmosphere due to its size and <clears throat> created absolute Armageddon, um, on the planet and uh, you combine that with the fact that uh, uh, India has moved over the reunion hotspot and uh, yeah it's basically when India moves over the reunion hotspot right around this time uh, it the volcanic activity uh, just goes tenfold and uh, create what we know as the Deccan Traps, which uh, essentially um, cause big problems um, in, the, uh, in the climate. Uh, the earth is already starting to cool off, sea levels were dropping, and now tons and tons of ash and soot's getting put into the air uh, from the Deccan Traps, and that is, of course, you know, creating havoc with the climate, it's starting to fluctuate a lot. Um, and uh, it's just the Earth is having a rough time in the in the last uh, 10 million years or so of the Cretaceous, which is when the Cretaceous ends, that's the end of the dinosaurs. And then we go in from the uh, Mesozoic into the Cenozoic, um, which is, you know, age of the mammals. So, on we go. Okay, so the end of the Cretaceous, experience, uh, Cretaceous period um, signifies uh, the end of the dinosaurs, the end of uh, marine uh, reptiles, uh, a, a whole plethora of, of um, marine organisms, um, and it, it uh, kills up to about 70% of the, the uh, Earth's life forms. And you know, we are always kind of, you ask any seven-year-old, oh, what happened to the dinosaurs? Oh, they immediately assume that it was, you know, we're taught to believe that it was, you know, an asteroid that did it all, and that was that, and, um, you yeah, know, and it certainly could have, um, and at the time, in the 70s, when it's really started to come to fruition, um, and into the 80s, uh, it really, you know, we've had the, the iridium layer, we had the we found the crater, uh, we found, you know, it, it, everything, definitely something hit the earth at 65 million years ago. There's no doubt about it. If it was the sole proprietor of the extinction event, well, that is, remains to be seen. And it is probably one of the most, if not the most contested um, theories uh, in, in my field. Uh, you know, it's to this day, there's just... People that you know, it's the traps. No, it's the it's 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 the you know the impact. You know, it, 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 it the argument goes round and round and round. Um, and I'm going to go over several reasons why it's probably both. Um, at least that's been the you know the, that's the interp interpretation I think is the most likely event. Um, I think they both caused a, a ton of problems. Um, the deck on traps were really just leading up. And then, you know, the last thing you really needed was an impact event. However, we are now starting to think that maybe the impact actually excited the traps. And if that's the case, then now we've t definitely got some correlations going on. And I'm going to lay out some uh, graphs and stuff to show that there's a 
it, it, there's a lot of evidence pointing that after the impact, the traps really started cranking. In fact, as much as two thirds of the amount came out right after the impact event. So uh, we know for a fact that the traps were going on prior to the event and then after the impact event. It's just the majority of the volume seems to happen right after. So there's a good possibility that they may be related. Uh, it's not, you know, per se, perfectly on the other side of the world from where this is. I, you know, you, you can make an argument that also that, you know, if you have waves that go around the globe, they converge at a certain area. That's all great, and I mean, if it was perfectly there, then I mean, that would just add to the list of, of, of evidence, but um, it's not, um, it's not that far away either. Um, you know, who's to say, I, as a surfer, I can tell you this, that waves uh, are moved and bent and, and uh, refract around all sorts of things. So, you know, who's to say where the actual uh, pinpoint of the energy went out the other side. I mean, it could have been anywhere. Could have been all of it. I don't know. But in any case, uh, we do think that the impact of it may have had an earthquake in the order of magnitude of 11, which means that if it truly was what we would refer to as 11, it means it was not. It was a, it was a magnitude 9 around the globe, like uniformly. You could be in uh, Florida or you could be in, um, you know, uh, Nome, Alaska, and you're going to feel the same thing big, big earthquake. So, um, and not to mention the fact that um, these give off a lot of toxic stuff, right? So that's not helping anything. Uh, we know that these contributed to uh, a few different things, especially uh, radical climate uh, fluctuations. Um, so, you know, this was already starting problems for about Maybe we'll just say, you know, 8 to 10 million years prior to the extinction event or to the impact event. And then this comes along and sort of finishes the job. That's the approach I take with it. And again, this may have actually contributed to this getting erupting a lot more volume than, than it would have. So let's uh, take a look. So mass extinction with correlation to LITS and terrestrial impacts. Excuse me. Um... So over here is your volcanism and your lip. You over here are your impact events, and here is your, you know, your bar graph of uh, extinction event int intensities over time. Again, the big five: boom, 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 boom. Those are the big five. Well, all right. So uh, uh, Ordovician Silurian one. Um, really, maybe some small impacts. Um, definitely no, no, no known lips associated with it, but a pretty big extinction event. So. All right, probably more or less, uh, you know, uh, related to maybe something of, of these impacts here, but hard to say. Uh, definitely a lip right here on the Devonian one. Uh, numerous impacts right here. So coincide. You got one in both. You got a big. You got a big extinction event. Um, Siberian traps uh, in relation to the to the uh, per Permian tri uh, Triassic, the biggest one of them all. Don't have any real um, uh, impact events, but my God, you've got probably one of the largest known um, uh, flood basalt episodes that we know of, um, as well as one right before it. So this is definitely related to the Permian-Triassic event, and that's really all it took to do it. But again, um, I do even do a lecture on this, but this isn't solely the, 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 the culprit. There's good evidence that we already have another extinction event right here, a massive one. It's just as much smaller than that one. But what this, what's going on between this period here and then the, here is the Earth is really starting to warm up. Uh, we went through a glaciation here, um, and then things start to begin to warm, uh, especially near the end of it. Um, and there's acidification of the oceans uh, and, and, and uh, anoxia of the oceans because of the warming. And uh, that has the, the, the acidification is because the mountains that were created when Pangaea came together uh, essentially are no longer there. So they're not taking up and sucking up the CO2 like they were back here. Now there's all this CO2. It's going into the ocean. It's going to the atmosphere. The atmosphere is heating up. The, uh, the oceans are getting acidic. And the heat alone is going to make the oceans become more anoxic. So you've got bad ocean. Um, and then you've got the traps come along. So we're just going to get we're, trap lips live. Lips are definitely the culprit on this one. They're at least they're the, they're the nail in the coffin. 
Triassic, Jurassic extinction event, uh, that is from the opening of the Atlantic, more or less, uh, and, and basically the rifting of the Atlantic Ocean uh, throughout the Mesozoic keeps everything relatively warm. So we're going to go, that's more or less, there's no impacts associated with that. Um, and then there's lifts through the record up here, but then we've got the big Decon ones right here, or Decon, however you want to pronounce it, with a gigantic, the one of the largest known impact events, and that is your extinction event. So it, for the most part, lifts are generally involved, uh, they're usually involved with extinction events, um, with the exception of maybe here. So I find good evidence that it's not just this. I think just this alone is, is, is suggesting that uh, it, the deck on traps are definitely part of the problem. So that's that. So here's India and the traps, you know, this is what's left of them, but the fact that you get some out here, well, you know, they didn't just leapfrog over here. It's a good chance that this whole area was probably covered with these things. Um, so uh, you're just seeing what's left of it. So there's been 65 million years of erosion uh, since these occurred, not to mention they're near the equator. So they get massive amounts of erosion. And oddly enough, you know, it's rain goes this way. And that means that this part of it's been eroded the most. Um, and, and, and basically, uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's helping keep, uh, this for certainly helped keep the uh, atmosphere somewhat cool um, after the, uh, the eruptive event. So that's why we always think of it, you know, sort of an ice age after the dinosaur period. And the cold temperatures definitely did persist. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the mammals did so well. Uh, so anyways, that's that. Uh, Decon traps, volcanism, uh, and related uh, mercury. So one of the things we also noticed about this whole thing is that um, there seems to be a, a ton of mercury that is associated with this particular uh, event. And that is a problem because mercury is really no good for anything. Um, it, especially life. Life just does not really enjoy mercury causes problems, cancer, all sorts of sicknesses associated with it. And, you know, as you can see right here, you know, you have, this is when the eruptive rates start really cranking right here about 66 million years ago. Um, and, I mean, look at the mercury spike that comes out of this right here. I mean, this is, uh, that's an issue. Uh, when you have a mercury spike like that, that's going to be very poisonous to to many species right there. So let's just put that on the list of things that possibly contributed to um, that happening. Crazy. All right, set up prior to the uh, extinction event. I should say extinction in there. I just had to fix that. Remember everybody, this is a, uh, a dry run. This is my first time doing this. so. Uh, the polishing will not come until probably sometime late this spring. Um, in any case, uh, so the setup, 200 million uh, years ago to about 70, we have massive rifting, lava outpouring associated with the breakup of uh, the supercontinent Pangaea and the Triassic. Uh, it warmed the climate it, it, it substantially during the Mesozoic and peaked in the late Cretaceous. Um, that really should be even more. Uh, when I wrote this, I... Yeah, I've just, you know, it's, I just seem to, the more you don't know, the more you know, I guess. Uh, this goes on through the uh, Triassic and the Jurassic, and because of, uh, well, the next, the next bullet summarizes that, um, the creation of the Atlantic Ocean and Indian Ocean, extreme ocean crust production, raises the sea levels worldwide. Now, this is important because during the Triassic and, the, and, the, and, and Jurassic, when the world was warm, one of the reasons it stayed that way is because the, the mid-ocean crust lifted, the world's oceans and, and, and the sea levels associated with them. And it basically flooded the interiors. And when you have water flooding the interiors of continents, it regulates uh, temperature fluctuations. So therefore you have a stable climate. Life likes stable climate, it doesn't like crazy wide fluctuations. Plus there's a whole area of swampland and just perfect for, you can't imagine a better uh, um, scenario for life to thrive. Big worldwide, Tropical loveliness, swamps in the middle of the, of the continents, lots of stuff, lots of food, 
lots of uh, lots of life. So very important. And about a hundred million years after the you know the the Atlantic gets its uh, gets everything going and 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 uh, we have a, a a slowdown in crustal production. I'm sorry, not crustal production. Well, oceanic crust production and the mid ocean ridges be, start to relax a little bit and then. Um, the seaways begin to drain off of the uh, the continents, and anything that you know that water water dwelling that lived there they had to adapt or die, and anything that ate that had to adapt or die, and, and, and so on and so on. So this started to really begin to stress life at about uh, about 100 million years, and then it just begins to accelerate up to about 70. So higher sea level equal more water equals more water surface area that's regulating temperature extremes of the world and it stayed that way for the majority of the period of time that's true but india is about to move over the reunion hotspot uh and it is during this time that the the reptiles become the dominant species so uh this is looks complicated uh and it is um my light just went off i need to fix that Okay, apologize about that. Um, and luckily for me, I've learned how to use the pause button. Otherwise, that proved to be a real pain in the ass. Anyway, global temperature versus oceanic crust production. This is uh, the main thing I wanted to uh, show on this graph. Um, I'm trying to figure out where global temperature. Okay, uh, where are we here? Um, okay, so time went this way. So, oh yeah, temperature. Here we go. Um, so here's the KT event. Um, here's about the time I, I, the period I was, I was I was talking about, and this is intense ocean intense oceanic uh, ocean crust growth. Okay. So this is the signifies Pangea is right here. Pangea comes together here, stays together, begins to break up here, and then the Atlantic Ocean really opens right here. And then you have plus also the Tethys, uh, the Tethys begins to close, um, and the Indian Ocean and uh, in the Indian Ocean opens. But this period right here is just incredible, intense oceanic crust, and that is shown by this right here. You can see the the graph right here going up and that's because the oceanic crust is being built and created and it and it and, and it, when you need to, when you pump out that amount of magma you have you have you lift the surrounding crust just just due to the buoyancy and heat um and if the same thing also goes with the sea level sea level continues to rise through the uh through the jurassic and most of the cretaceous creating a just an epic area for life to thrive and you have the dinosaurs just flourish in this time period um, and that's one of the most important things is, is, is this rising sea level, creating interior seaways that helps the, uh, the dinosaurs just thrive. And they really do. And then it peaks and then it begins to slow down. And as it starts to slow down, uh, you, you can see uh, temperature uh, plateau and actually begin to drop. You see sea level start to drop. Um, and of course, you see now you start to you start to, you start to make your way towards the extinction event. So, really, and, and and another thing to take out of this is is that CO2, you know, for the most part, it, you know, it it, it kind of came up, it dropped, and then it kind of came up and dropped, but it was much higher then than it is today. Like today, it's way down here. We're in fact in this time we're in the you know 2,000 2, parts per million. So. Um, and again, right here is the defining line. All of a sudden, it goes on a long decline once that uh, oceanic crust production stops. So a lot, a lot of things combined with this. Um, so crustal production going up, sea level going up, temperatures going up, uh, and high amounts of CO2, which are helping keep the Earth warm. Global temperatures over the last uh, 500 million years. We do only 500, really, because that's what's important as far as life goes. Prior to that, we were just, uh, you know, we weren't, we, we, we didn't even have skeletons. We weren't even capable of growing them yet. Um, so right around 540, when life just flourishes and we, and we do get the calcium carbonated organisms starting to happen, uh, temperature was very high. And this is the, the passive margins of 
the east coast of where we are now um, of Laurentia, big reefs, and you know, all buried now in Vermont where the marbles are. High temperature, beautiful right on the equator. Temperature goes and then it plummets and uh, then it spikes back up and then it rises again. And, and uh, you know, you can go back and you can look at the geologic record and you can really correlate, you know, some of these things, you know, uh, if, if you really want to, um, you know, you, you want to, to, to wonder why we have these fluctuations and what the impact is on life. Usually they correspond with extinction events. Um, I'm fairly certain there's one right in here and then the Ordovician one in here somewhere. Um, and of course, we have this rapid, uh, crazy uh, climbing one right here. And this is, of course, the extinction event of, of the Permian. Uh, and then again, a radical drop after that. And then uh, right again, about 200 things bottom out, and then you have oceanic crust production getting, and of course this is a pumping the heat uh, from all the CO2 being released, and you peak right here about 100 million, maybe 95 million, and then you drop, and, and crustal production also drops. And then, because uh, again, associated with this drop in temperature, uh, and, and the, and the, uh, the drop in sea level, and the uh, interior seaway is diminishing, you, uh, you've got, uh, life is beginning to stress out right in here, especially in the last 10 million years, and then you get the impact, and that's the end of that. Uh, dinosaur is gone, and, and then you, the impact and the deck on traps are causing the fluctuations, very, very intense fluctuations for about 10 million years or so, and then uh, things begin to start to mellow out a little bit. So, yeah. Uh, sea level change related to supercontinent cycle. So, uh, you know, there's just more evidence uh, pointing to that, you know, uh, you can have uh, major uh, extinction events uh, related to just where you are in the, in the, in the supercontinent cycle. So, um, we go back, you know, Rod Rodinia came together and then it back over here and then it rifted uh, and you get uh, crustal production and it kind of peaks right here uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, late Ordovician. Then you get um, um, everything starting to come together. So you have uh, subduction across the globe coming to converge to Pangaea. And then we have Pangaea separate and crustal production is going up to make the Atlantic. And then, um, and then after the Atlantic has basically reached a fairly decent size, along with the Indian, crustal production begins to wane again. And we are now going back down. Uh, and this is re just basically relating to, to sea level change. So very sea level seems to to uh, rise when uh, the continents are rifting apart and it seems to uh, go down when continents are coming together when there's subduction which makes perfect sense because you don't get subduction unless you have cold dense crust and cold dense crust is going to actually sink further into the into the uh, globe or the earth due to gravity and we peaked right here and then we had a very serious drop and again serious drops in sea level seem to really correspond with guess what? Extinction events. Because here's our biggest one right here. And huh, surprise, right on the border. Boom, right on the money. Massive sea level drop. Big extinction. Massive sea level drop. Big extinction. Uh, not one really here. Uh, we have a, a pretty steep drop, but the Devonian one might be related to something else. But it, it does not uh, really um, uh, indicate, you know, it's not as serious as these other ones. We do have one right here in the Ordovician slurry, and that's definitely a uh, an extinction event due to a drop. I mean, they're drops. Yeah, I guess almost all of them do kind of correlate with a drop. Huh, interesting. <clears throat> all right, Cretaceous global view. 94 million years ago, you have the huge subduction that's opened up over here. That is, uh, you know, you got uh, it's pulling and closing this whole ocean. India is being ripped off. Continents are being separated. Antarctica, Australia are going uh, basically southeast. India is going uh, northeast. Africa is kind of creeping its way towards the north-northeast. Um, we have the reunion hotspot right here, and India is moving very quickly towards this hotspot. <coughs> and we have the future impact site of the um, on the uh, Yucatan of the uh, Chicxulub uh, meteor uh, impact. Uh, event. So uh, this is important to keep in mind. Um, this hot spot, especially when this gets pulled over this, this is essentially just making, it's, it's a nothing but a constant pump of magma 
welling up from the mantle, making and punching through the crust, um, and essentially uh, just you know creating a, a, a just a continuous uh, a area of volcanoes. Depending on which way the plate goes, uh, there'll be a chain of them following it. So it makes a volcano, and then it it moves off of it, makes a new volcano, moves off of it. But once this comes over this. This is going to begin erupting under this, and what's going to happen is it's going to go, it's going to start melt. This, these magmas are super hot, and believe it or not, this piece of crust is also going to punch down equally as far as it, as it, as it sits high. So when this goes over this hot spot, it's the, the, the core, the root of India is going to dive into this plume, um, and it's just going to melt like crazy and produce a massive amount of... Uh, of um of magma and the magma is going to need to come out somewhere in here and what it's going to do is it's going to bottle up under here until it finds a uh basically a conduit and then once it does it's going to be like a shaken soda bottle and it is just going to start releasing uh massively and, he, and then when it starts releasing it's the decompressional uh, uh decompressional uh melting is going to start to occur so you almost have like a, a double effect uh you've got magma built up you got melting and then the, the, the magma punches through the pressure begins to release and then you have accelerated uh, decompressional melting and you just have uh, one of the world's largest uh, flood basalts produced um, and that's what's going to happen global view at 69.4 million years ago now we've moved up a 30 million there's our hot spot I mean our uh, impact event there is our Union hot spot and India is now about to go over and like I said when this gets when this comes over, it's probably going to shut it off for a little bit. Um, I don't know how long, but it's going to start piling up under this sub uh, under this uh, uh, under this this subcontinent. And even worse, the deep roots. I mean, the ocean crust isn't very deep. It's fairly you know it's very thin and it's pretty easy to punch through. But you get a gigantic piece of uh, you know granite, ignite, and stuff like that. It is not easy to melt. It is not easy to uh, it is not easy to punch through. It's thick and but once it but because it's felsic it's going to melt uh it, it, when it does melt it will melt uh quicker than the surrounding oceanic crust but what's going to happen is it's going to just start building up under here uh and until it you know it either breaks through just by sheer pressure alone or a crack opens from faulting from lifting it, it whatever it is it's it going to eventually find its way out and when it does that's when it's uh and that's when the pressure gets released and all the the melting the, the magma melt of the continent plus the 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 hot spot plus the mantle uh all that is just going to go nuts and then come out uh cretaceous uh this is uh, uh north america 75 million years ago and here we are right here uh and what i want you to notice is that the, we have an interior seaway and again this is very good at regulating the climate in here uh, and plus, think of the amount of aquatic life that's in here. Without this, I mean, you're taking away a huge part. And all of this area of Europe is kind of Baltic is flooded, or flooded here, flooded here. <coughs> all of this is just teeming with life. So it's important. And this is basically before everything starts to go nuts. So, um, again, another map of oceanic uh, crust production and sea level. Uh, again opening of the Atlantic boom it just comes up and up and up and sea level follows it you know just couldn't ask for a nicer trend on that um, then you have your carbon issues here uh, you know do you have less or more generally when you have the eruptions it tends to to go up um, as you can see uh, down here yes yeah, it starts to go up um, right here uh, another spike here spike um, here spike uh, and then you have your anoxic events and uh, I'm not seeing much in the way uh, here um, so we're not towards the end we're not really getting that much of an anox at least not by this map anyway um, but I am curious because well we'll get to that anyway High crust production, high sea level. Crustal production stops, sea level begins to fall. 
Now, at 65 million years ago, Seaway is gone. Impact, not yet. Oh yeah, impact is right around this time. Um, so here we are. This, this gone, this is now becoming uh, very cold in the winter, very hot in the summer. You're getting extreme temperature fluctuations. And for 100 million years, the creatures that lived here were not used to that. Um, in fact, any of the sea life that's here has now had to either adapt or, or, or is gone. So you've got mass extinction in here. You've got death along here because the shelf is drained. Um, things are happening. And, and not just that, but the oceans are, are, are basically, they're, they're, um, all of this water had to go back into the oceans. So you're bringing all sorts of uh, sediments in, into the oceans or what have you. Um, so the oceans are, are, are definitely going through a change right, uh, uh, right prior to the extinction event. So uh, to about 75 million years, you still had some seaways. At 100 million years, you definitely had some very large seaways. In fact, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a given that, that, that you know, the Cretaceous is known to have interior seaways through most of the continents around, around the Earth. But uh, at 65, it's all gone. You're getting massive temperature fluctuations. The anything that lived here had to adapt or die. Uh, so things are, are have changed quite a bit in a relatively short time. And as we know, life life can sometimes have troubles with that. All right, the event. This is 70 million to 65 million. Oceanic production, pr crustal production begins to wane, lowering sea levels worldwide, draining seaways off the continents, exposing new land surface, thus stressing many of the species that lived in those locations. Life forms are definitely stressed. The lack of an interior seaway has allowed temperatures to fluctuate uh, much more radically on land and, and eventually uh, the, the sea due to draining and mixing and cooling of seawater. The lack of volcanic activity, CO2 production, further enhanced the cooling of the global climate. Uh, India has now moved over the reunion hotspot and started a major volcanic event, the Dikon Traps, affecting the Earth. Slowly at first, but then increasing, eventually it produced enough lava to barely California 2 kilometers deep or the U.S. 200 feet thick. The initial release of SO2 and CO2 uh, reflects sunlight and causes major climate fluctuations. So, the Dikon Traps of India. Uh, this is what they look like. Uh, they are just basically lava flow after lava flow after lava flow after lava flow is stacked on each other. Um, this is the area that they likely covered. Um, they are, you know, the difference between these and the Siberian traps is I think I've read a few places that the Deccan traps produce some of the largest lava flows, in the, if not the largest known lava flows in the world. I don't think the Deccan traps either uh, you can't trace it or um, we haven't been able to trace them that far but these ones we that we've labeled I believe these was having some of the thickest biggest just traveling like thousands of mile lava flows so they're kind of unique uh, the Deccan traps they are a large igneous province located on the Indian subcontinent peninsula uh, they produce some of the largest known lava flows possibly covering an area the size of India with a bulk mass uh, it, it extruded over a mile deep um, they are thought to have been initiated by Indian movement over the Reunion hotspot around 66.5 million years ago. Um, the release of volcanic gases, particularly sulfur dioxide, uh, during the formation of the traps may have contributed to climate change. An average drop in temperature of about uh, 3.6 or, or 2 degrees C was recorded during this period. Although it had started to erupt prior to the uh, Chicxulub event, um, eruption rates will appear to increase 8 to 10 times on an order of magnitude very close and after the date times, the date times of the Chicxulub impact event. So uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, the majority of the um, traps were formed at, uh, immediately after the impact event, suggesting they may be related. All right, Deccan traps cross cuts. Um, this is the location. Uh, I guess this is sort of a, you know, uh, if you were to slice into the earth, this is the line of which you'd see. Um, and more or less, this is what you get. You get layer after layer. These are all just different lava flows. Um, and I have put on here the impact event right here. And so if this, and if this particular column is correct, uh, even though it looks like half is here and half is here, 
this is not truly the case. Uh, there, it is actually much more of a two-third uh, two here, one-third thing. And I apologize that that is not clear in the in this, but you can see that the flows are very are much smaller for the most part. They begin to take, but the biggest ones are right here. Um, so we'll take a look at that in more detail. Um, and again, uh, that like, like I showed this uh, this to you earlier. This is the impact event, and uh, it corresponds really, really nicely with uh, right after um, the uh, uh, the eruption rates right here. Um, and what you're seeing here is uh, the mercury spike. And as I said earlier, the mercury is not good for anything. So uh, you have uh, a, 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 you have essentially uh, an impact event here. You have eruptive rates that have just pumped a bunch of mercury into the air, and you know, and that's that's what you get. Now, how do we know that this had happened? Well, this is uh, a rock taken from the KT boundary uh, layer. And this rock suggests uh, we have the Cretaceous here, which are uh, basically, I believe this rock is showing me, you know, a light colored, uh, could be a carbonate, could be, could be a sandstone. Um, silty shale I, I it's hard to tell but in any case you have uh, a very unique layer right here of iridium and the, iridium is found only in the core of the earth for the most part you might find trace amounts of it but, but but it is found widely uh you and, and fairly uniformly uh on uh primordial space objects they're loaded with it um and because of that, because they've not had a chance to differentiate, so they're they, they're given a set amount of iridium, um, kind of like the, the Earth has a set amount, but it all went to one place because it's very heavy, and that's the core. Um, so when you get um, a meteorite impact, a lot of ir iridium, much more than you would find in the surrounding, you know, background levels, is pumped into the air, and then it settles out as clays uh, or dust, uh, which is right here. And then above this. Obviously, this is something has occurred because there's a huge change. Uh, you have nice light color here, then you have a very dark color here, and this is probably due to anoxia or or just uh, uh, just just uh, I, I could be a lot of ash. I, I don't know, um, but uh, it, to me, it's kind of telling me that this is an anoxic uh, environment right here. Chicxulub impact. 66.51 million years ago. All right, I'm going to go back a layer. Okay, so 66.51 years ago. A 6.9 uh, metallic rock impacts the Earth near present-day Yucatan Peninsula, punching a hole through the Earth's crust 20 kilometers deep into the mantle and 200 kilometers wide. The impact has the following repercussions. An 11 magnitude earthquake, a 9.0 essentially felt worldwide, 60 days of darkness. Most species within 100 miles are essentially burned within minutes. I'm sorry, most species within a thousand miles are essentially burned within minutes and others take longer, but most meet the same fight. Tsunamis affect all oceans, but the Gulf of Mexico uh, likely saw wave heights of over 1,000 feet and slammed into the U.S. less than two hours, running hundreds of miles inland, killing just about everything in its path. The 11.0 uh, magnitude earthquake agitates most of the Earth's crust, possibly causing a massive increase in volcanism worldwide. And most importantly in India, which is almost located almost directly on the other side of the impact site. Again, it's not perfectly, but it is over on the other side. Um, all of the P waves, S waves, and Riley waves likely met uh, near a location somewhere on the other side of the world. Uh, maybe it was India, maybe it was not, but it, it, it could have been terribly far off. Um, 
And again, you have no idea how, what, how these are going to behave through the planet, you know, giving the different densities. So uh, we'll just take that with a grain of salt. But, but the Riley, they probably met somewhere on the other side and converged and maybe even ex accelerated uh, movements in, in certain places, uh, thus uh, agitating the crust and the planet and amplified them to unknown proportions, causing an 8 to 10 times increase in lava output there. So this is the statement that really, uh, you know, some of it, speculative for sure um you know where the waves p waves are going. i don't even think that even matters i just think that when you have uh when you have think of a, a very a huge giant cork and, and a really agitated uh champagne bottle that's been being shook uh that is what the cap of india is doing over the reunion hotspot it's like a, a champagne cork and, and and it's just and it's already started to punch through but it's it's not not quite to the glory it's going to be and then you have an earthquake coming you shake the hell out of it well that's just going to make the bubbles even more you're going to exude more power and more pressure it's going to shake the crust and maybe even fracture a little more just enough to give it that kick that it needs um and i think that this is the money right here i think that this has something to do with it um and again you know it really comes down to how how, how precise the dating is between these two events uh, we know that volcanism likely also got agitated worldwide. So, you know, it's coming back to something like this and, and figuring out 66.5. Yeah, you know, it's pretty much uh, that is actually right about here. So this really needs to be here. I think I did that on one of my other slides. Um, hold on. Okay, sorry, I had to fix that. That was driving me nuts, but this correlates essentially perfectly. Um, get rid of that thing. So, in any case, uh, let's go back to where we were. Um, and again, this is the money. This is the money right here. Uh, it, I, connecting this event to the Decon traps. Uh, continued, uh, I fed, uh, dust produced and released massive amounts of toxin into the air, i.e. mercury, uh, causing, uh, acid rain. That's the, you know, uh, all the sulfur and everything released the air. Um, so that eventually, uh, acidifies the ocean and, uh, there's, so therefore there's no reproduction and no removal of CO2. Um, it also released a, a massive amount of mercury, iridium, which is the only found at the Earth's core and coincidentally formed bottles like comets and asteroids. It caused an immediate rapid cooling of the climate to the SO2 and dust, which likely halted photosynthesis for months. Uh, for, uh, for, uh, for months, maybe, maybe followed by years of rapid warming due to the CO2 due to increased volcanism. So just basically um, uh, burning and then up and down temperatures and then acid rain and then mercury and then uh, cooling, uh, you know, after the eruption, you know, uh, uh, massive cooling right after this, followed by uh, rapid warming. Um, and then you have, you know, the, the traps probably popping off and then that's, they're kind of offsetting that even. So uh, it, it's very difficult for life to really uh, find any stability at this particular time. Uh, the crater. Um, this is sort of a, uh, a cross section of the crater. Uh, this is the Yucatan Peninsula. This is sort of the outline of it. Uh, this is a little bit closer. So really half of it's on land and then the other half is out in the water. Um, this is more or less sort of a, a time, like, you know, T minus zero minutes, uh, asteroid, uh, you know, everything's great. Uh, T minus one minute, asteroid has now hit. It is punched through. It has uh, created a massive melt down here. Uh, it's basically vaporized and melted, and everything's just getting turned up, and it's about ready to get tossed out. Um, you have the rebound right here of the crust. Um, you have the, the, the impact melt right here. Uh, at T minus three, at T minus 30 minutes, you've got uh, water that has been blasted out and then it's coming back in. Uh, at 30 minutes, you've got, you know, you've got faulting, uh, you've got all these different things that have happened. Uh, at T minus one hour, you have waves going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and then, you know, over the next couple of hours, the, you know, the crater begins to, to cool down a little bit. You've got sediment falling back in, ash, but you've got a whole impact structure now 
associated with this area and it's you know this is the outline and this is consequently f uh, found because um oil companies were looking you know they figured this might be a great area to look for oil the truth is um you know oil companies are some of the most thorough geologists out there and they really you can thank a lot of the stuff we know uh, especially about the oceans and carbonates and what have you uh, from them um, how do we know it is there? Well, um, this is a, uh, I guess you could call this a uh, uh, gravity um, uh, gravity map. So you can kind of see a ring structure right here. Um, you know, generally uh, these, these, the, the gravity will show uh, areas of dense materials and light materials. Um, over here, I believe this is magnetic um, and the the magnetics actually this is magnetic here this is gravity I apologize um, it's magnetics here uh, and, and what you're seeing here uh, are just concentrated areas where you uh, that's not magnetics I believe these are both gravity these are both gravity overlays um, I haven't looked at these for a while. I apologize. Hold on. I apologize. Uh, they are both um, magnetic. I mean, um, gravity. I thought that was weird because you really wouldn't find much in the way of magnetics out here. Um, so they're just both gravity. They're just uh, different styles. This is showing you this maybe that you know the, the, the surface ring structure. Uh, whereas this one here is showing you the uh, the subsurface. Um, this is what you are you're going to see. Basically, the uh, the imprint, you know, relatively close to the surface. And this is what you would see if you were uh, looking uh, much deeper into the crust. So this is more of a 3D view. And what you can see is a central peak here. Um, you can see the impact structure right here. Uh, looks like a, a, a some sort of a piece of the of, of the comet may or, or the asteroid hit here maybe just an odd shape it hit here and then whacked right here and then kind of rolled a little bit so maybe this is the the actual imprint of it i don't this almost looks like something here i i don't know could be a piece of it um but yeah you can clearly see this is the uh, by the way the land the outline of the uh the same as this right here this is the outline of the shoreline of the yucatan um but you can really see uh this structure and um, that's how we know it's there blast radius um, so I guess if you were somewhere in this circle here uh, that would flatten any forest and probably any city or anything that's within that uh, you'd have hurricane force winds out here and I'm not talking like 70 miles an hour 75 probably like 150 mile an hour um, you have ejecta deposits from this impact found everywhere you know these are just some of the locations the blast radius is you know well over a thousand kilometers easily uh events within uh 24 hours this is what you would expect on your uh impact delivery you get an impact of course you have the carbonate platform which just gets vaporized in some places and punches through and creates a massive hole like 200 miles wide um, puts a point of dust in the air. It comes uh, fully uh, loaded with uh, mercury. Um, uh, and so you're just going to basically block out the sun for at least a month when this thing hits. Um, after, the, you know, within a couple of hours or whatever, you're going you're gonna to have this big seething cauldron of, of, of uh, just death, you know, boiling water, melted crust, uh, just, just everything horrible you can imagine. Very primal. Uh, and then water coming back in and just probably getting vaporized when it does because exploding can't imagine the explosions uh, from the water receding back in um, and then of course you know you've got debris getting pumped out and then you've got your tsunami spreading out into North America whatever Mexico South America probably worldwide um, so you know that's essentially what you'd be getting impact summary um, Plain language summary, at the end of the Cretaceous, about 66 million years ago, uh, the Chicxulub uh, asteroid impact near the Yucatan Peninsula produced a global tsunami 
3,000 times more energetic than any modern day tsunami produced by earthquakes today. I don't know what that looks like, but 30,000, I mean, even twice as much is scary. Um, so gravity anomaly here. Uh, this is what I guess you would expect. Um, let's go down the list of goodies. We have, uh, uh, these are local uh, and regional effects. We have your uh, fireball radiation, air blast, earthquake, tsunami, uh, very, be very beneath majecta, my favorite. Um, Got to have that. that that's what's going to happen uh, within probably, um, you know, uh, within a day. Um, then you got your fires, burning, soot cooling, pro, uh, pyrotoxins. Oh, yeah, that's a mercury acid rain. That's within a month. Um, and then you're looking at years. You've got no photosynthesis, loss of vision, cooling. Uh, uh, no oxygen production. This is bad. Uh, acid rain, ozone loss, and cooling. Yeah, because if the trees aren't breathing, you're not getting any oxygen produced. Um, SO2 production is going to cause cooling and acid rain. You've got heavy metal poisoning, another wonderful thing to have uh, whenever you have an impact in your neighborhood. And then you have um, uh, greenhouse warming from uh, H2O plus CO2, and that's going to go on for decades. So this is what you get when you have an impact. Uh, and considering that you've already had problems uh, due to the, uh, the Indian subcontinent going over... Um, the reunion hotspot acidifying the oceans uh, and then the the reduction in sea level from the uh, mid-ocean ridges uh, essentially slowing down you have got uh, an already stressed uh, world full of life that's um, trying to figure it out and then this comes and this is just the icing on the cake and this is where the dinosaurs just cannot cope in fact anything really any bigger than uh, I forget what the cutoff weight was but I think it's something like I want to say 60 kilos, but that sounds light. But I think anything bigger than, say, a human being, really, or a or like a, maybe a dog, um, does not do well. Uh, basically, this, anything small that can, can hide lives. But anything that's bigger than that does not. So adding it all up. Decon traps erupt initially slow, but enough to cool, then heat the climate. Oceanic crust production wanes, sea level drops, exposing continental interior seaways and shells, also allowing more extreme weather fluctuations. Drop in sea level also stresses out species that live there and those that feed on them. Decon traps release toxins, mercury into the atmosphere, uh, you know, causing poisoning. Impact events, uh, impact event occurs blocking out sun. Uh, 9 to 10, 9 to 11 magnitude earthquake creates massive tsunami worldwide, generates 9.0 quake worldwide, triggering volcanism worldwide, possible, possibly, supposed to say, uh, causing decon traps to erupt 8 to 10 times previous rate. Uh, massive volcanism, I mean, massive temperature fluctuations in short period of time due to uh, impact and volcanism. Um, that's, that's true. Uh, you're going to have, I mean, you're, the temperatures, the, the, the the climate is just going nuts. Um, volcanism also acidifies oceans and may contribute to anoxia of water bodies, as evidenced by the dark shales around the world uh, um, after. And uh, primary food sources are wiped, res resulting in worldwide famine. Other things to consider. Possible massive increase of lava. Flex crust and may be related to vertical cracks and lavas older than impact, but don't show up after impact. I'm going to explain this. Uh, this is a really interesting theory right here. Um, sea level drop later in Cretaceous. No sea waves is camp output decrease, uh, lowering oceanic crust, which makes temperature more susceptible or climate more susceptible to temperature extremes, which stresses near shores. And we already went over that. And that's true. Um, all right. So uh, I'm going to pause this for a second because I need to see where I am. Okay, um, the Deccan Trap uh, fractures and older lava flows. This is uh, sort of interesting. Um, so, uh, here is uh, 
here is just let's say um, a uh, magma chamber then we got some uh, some lava flows up here uh, ideally I should make some fractures in here um, but anyways just imagine they're there these are just older lava flows um, and then you get an intrusion um, this flexes the stress factors go up um, and then uh, fractures basically um, fractures basically show up through here as these begin to punch through uh, the conduits of the lava and then um, new lava flow after impact um, the new lava flow after impact with no vertical cracking and the reason this is is because the new magma intrusion right here so this is the lava flows prior to the influx of magma and this influx of magma and I need to fix this is caused that this new int magma intrusion is right when the impact occurs when the impact occurs um, it, it basically stirs this up magma gets pushed into it it flexes everything up and when it does it punches through and fractures these are vertical cracks okay um, and so now you have these vertical cracks up in here okay then everything punches through um, and then you have a new lava flow but there's no vertical cracks because the flexing has already occurred and it's not happening after that so basically everything as is you have the impact um, I, I'm gonna fix that right now because that needs to be fixed Okay, I'm going to run through this again. <clears throat> Hopefully I'm smart enough to edit that last part out. But the gist of this is here is there's um, <clears throat> some images, I, I, I think they're in this lecture, um, that show uh, areas that are lower or older um, lava flows on the DECOM traps through Google Maps when you look down <clears throat> and you see a bunch of cracks in them and then in the same ridge as you're going up a hill say these ones down here would be would be cracked and but the ones up above are not I mean the younger ones are not so sort of depicting what's going on I think impact prior to the impact event you had a magma chamber you got lava flows this is business as usual impact event you have vigorous shaking the vigorous shaking uh, agitates the crust the mantle <clears throat> uh, the magma chamber all of it so you may get uh, you may get just this chamber getting shaken up is going to you know again like the shaking of a coke bottle it might be just enough flex to start putting cracks up here and exerting pressure making its way out or the lower chamber could get could cause an injection in this any and mix this thus also cause any either way this gets excited this starts putting pressure up this way and this happens right at, right after impact event basically this is because of impact event <clears throat> sometime after the impact event when all of this is kind of mellowed out you're going to have uh it could be days could be months could be years um you have the chamber you've got the cracks that were pushed up through and you've got the vertical cracks uh right here uh in the magma chamber then at some point later you have uh, a, a new eruption and um the new lava flow after impact event basically comes up through the older layers that are cracked and this layer right here is not cracked and let's just say that you erode part of this like in a line that goes like that you would see these being cracked but this one would not be and that's the whole point of that and that might the idea is basically that when the impact event hit it was so much and it caused it was such an intense event that it actually made the magma chamber or, or for one reason just just go crazy and flex and maybe it was enough to actually flex part of the continent and show a bunch of cracks that were the result of that that's the point i'm trying to make across this all right so um <clears throat> let's look and see if you know if the rates really started picking up and again um so here is uh our uh 
uh, our impact event right here. These are the flows. Uh, this is the amount of, of, of magma produced prior, and then this is the amount after. And as you can see, it's a substantial amount. Um, <clears throat> and right here at the impact, we seem to have a massive leg up. And I think, and then there's another one right here. And this, you know, if we went from, this is kind of creeping along here, but if you get a massive influx like that in a very short period of time, that could be enough to flex. I don't know, but that's the, the gist of this right here. And again, uh, basically all of this came much after all of this. So this is, this is just showing you the impact event and then the flux of magma produced right at the time and then after. Um, eruptive uh, volume of Dickon traps. Okay, so um, <clears throat> here is the, the, the uh, uh, prior to the event, you've got these eruptions right here, and you have a, you know, basically a, 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 a pre event, um, uh, you have a pre, uh, a pre impact event volume of 124 times 10 to the negative three. Okay, pretty impressive. But then here at the impact event, you've got three major eruptions um, that constitute a total of 439. So that is about, you know, that, what is that? Um, that's three times the amount right there. Um, so you do see an incredible uptick right here uh, in eruptive activity. So uh, that is the point. So pretty much chill and then a massive uh, uh, impact and right at the boundary this is when it hits and then you see just an, an, an incredible uh flux of eruption rates pick up and this is the uh this is the temperature so it kind of popped up here and then it came there yeah, it, so it went up and then you had the eruption rates and then they kind of went down and then this just basically steadily made them but as you can see you get a drop after the initial eruption but then the co2 kind of catches up and you, you get a quick spike and then a drop and and so this is just basically just basically showing that eruptions are taking place and causing fluctuations in the temperature. All right, uh, what are we looking at here? We are looking at, oh yeah, these are probability graphs, I guess. Um, so this is more or less giving you uh, um, time of impact, I guess, uh, based on, um, based on uh, you know, uranium lead, um, then you have argon, argon, um, and I guess this is taken out of ash, um, and this is the eruption rates that we would have. Um, so, and this is the column that we were looking at. This is sort of like you know, this would be a strategy of a column, and we're looking. It, it kind of resents time, but uh, you know, it's not definite. It's just representing the volume, and then the volume we represent how much was put out at that particular time. So, here's the eruption rates here. Um, and 66, right here is, I believe, the, the event. Yeah, right here. And then we have a massive uptick and, of, of eruptions right here. Okay. Um, and then uh, we have the, uh, this is the probability of, of the impact event uh, according to uranium lead, which puts it right here. Um, and then we get the two-third. But then the argon, argon seems to put it down here at the base of this. So... Is it here or is it here? This is the question that sort of, you know, that, that, that we're all wondering. But in any case, no matter what, it just generates a ton of, um, of, of lava. And down here, um, kind of same thing. You know, you, you've got the, uh, you've got a, a delay on it according to lead, but the argon seems to think it's right about here. So, and that seems to also peak with the, uh, the um, the massive output of lava. I mean, they're right on the money. So hard to say, but I do think that this is, you know, this is suggesting that these two are related. And of course, the temperature. Uh, you know, I just give, give not always give a look at this because we are talking about an extinction event. And again, you know, it's this is Earth with caps where we are now. Um, this is the, the peak of the, the Permian, the peak of the Cretaceous and the downdrop, and then all the, the mayhem that came right after it uh, due to the extinction event of the Chicxulub and uh, 
the uh, the deck on traps. Sea level over the last 500 million years, again, right there, bang, drops. And seems to be associated with with uh, with with the uh, with an extinction event because it's right on the money right there. Uh, and same thing right here. All right, so the current synopsis. The Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, also known as the KT uh, extinction, was a sudden mass extinction of three quarters of the plant and animal species under approximately 66 million years ago. The event caused the extinction of all non-avian dinosaurs. Most other tetrapods weighing more than us, 20, 50, 25 kilograms, so small. Anything big was done. Also became extinct with the exception of ectothermic species such as sea turtles and crocodilians. It marked the end of the Cretaceous period and with it the Mesozoic era uh, while heralding the beginning of the Cenozoic era which continues today. Immediately after events 66, uh, 65 to 55 um, million years ago, uh, we can summarize it as such. Temperature exper temperatures experience extreme fluctuations and then begin to rise over the next 10 million years. The immediate nuclear winter uh, eradicates most species, both plant, animal, and marine. Landscapes worldwide are mostly barren, uh, populated by ferns and the species that can survive on them. Very important. Um, uh, Atlantic oceans become acidic uh, and are mostly barren. I'm sorry, Atlantic oceans, be, uh, Atlantic oceans, uh, oceans become acidic and possibly anoxic in some areas and take thousands if not millions of years to recuperate. Uh, small mammals and ground-dwelling birds begin to occupy the niches left behind by the dinos uh, and experience rapid diversification. Dinosaurs are gone. That is it. Uh, you're, they, they could not deal with it. Their foods were what their foods were. Their food was wiped out, um, and that was the end. They're just too big, required too much energy, and the reality is there just isn't much to go around. Bony fish, sharks, turtles, crocs, birds, amphibians, small mammals, uh, basically being small in the water, warm-blooded, having feathers. Uh, helped cross the KT extinction event. Of note was that the fungi took a hit, uh, it, it, but they, it's, they don't need photosynthesis to survive, and it actually thrived briefly after the event. So I just thought that was weird, that the fungi, they took a hit. They don't need any photosynthesis, which wasn't a problem because they don't need it, even though it was gone. Um, but they thrived right after the event because uh, the fungus really seemed to do pretty well. Um, you know, I, I don't really recall any giant fungus um, uh, extinctions. Do you? I mean, when's the great fungus extinction? Let me know. All right, we're going to stop here at the who made it and who did not, because uh, this is a part of the lecture um, that I might even need to brush up on, because uh, this, this, is, this gets kind of complicated. But anyway, have a good night, and uh, aloha.